This is the uh, Threat Intel track, and our next speakers are Rich Perkins and Mike Tassi. They're going to be speaking on aerial cyber apocalypse. If we can do it, so can they. Rich? Thanks. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Aerial Cyber Apocalypse. Uh, I have to apologize in advance. I've got a case of the Vegas and apparently I've lost my voice. <laughs> so, uh, before we begin, uh, we got a lot to cram into this 75 minutes, so uh, I'm going to try my best to get through some disclaimers here real quick and we'll do uh, intros and we'll get right into the uh, things you came here for. Um, we're going to talk to you today about UAVs. Um, Please keep in mind that the operation of UAVs uh, may be regulated in your area, so if you plan on doing any kind of work like this, please make sure you check the laws in your area. Uh, make sure you don't violate any of them. Uh, the last thing we need is more scrutiny from the, uh, from the authorities. Uh, also, keep in mind, these things are heavy. This is a 14-pound aircraft. Um, please don't operate them over uh, populated areas, although as tempting as it is to hear your neighbors uh, make sexy time over their cell phones, uh, it's not worth dropping a bowling ball in their house from 400 feet up. Uh, so with that said, my name is Mike Tassi. I'm a consultant for industry and government and a part-time tinker. I'm Rich Perkins. I'm a computer security engineer um, and uh, amateur radio operator and radio control enthusiast. Mike and I have been working on and off together for about the last 15 years, and we thought we'd bring one of our more ambitious projects here and talk to you about it today. What is the WASP or Wireless Aerial Surveillance Platform? Well, it all started back with a phone call back in October of 2009. Uh, I had a little time on my hand and I was reading some DIY articles on folks that were making their own first person view RC planes. And I thought that they were really cool. What a great idea. Uh, you're flying along and you can see what the plane sees. And uh, it's got great things for aerial photography and, uh, and, and lots of benefits. And I said, uh, we got to make one of these. So I called up Rich and I said, dude, we, we've got to make one of these. I have an idea. Let me tell you something, that's never a good idea when he starts a conversation with that, because that means I'm not getting any sleep for the near future. I took a look at the videos he sent me, and I realized the potential for, for what he had, had found, but I also realized that it had been done a lot, and I, and I wanted to kind of push us further. So I suggested that perhaps we should put a Kismet drone in an airplane and see what we could do with that. And, you know, war driving is a great idea, um, but it's sort of passive, and, uh, and if we're going to put a computer on the airplane anyway, uh, the thought occurred to us, uh, why don't we add some tools to it so that instead of just passively sniffing networks and gathering data, or visual information, we could actually interact with some of these things that we see from the air. And so I thought what, we should put on some, some testing tools, air crack or, or, or something along, along those lines, uh, so that we could actually do something uh, active with the aircraft. Uh, so when we did this, we, we decided we were going to use uh, some open source stuff. Uh, we were going to use tools that were already available. Uh, and we started talking about how we were going to, uh, you know, what, what kind of uh, metrics were we going to need to meet. Uh, we determined we were going to have to make uh, flight times uh, very important. Um, if you have 15 minutes of runtime, uh, you, you really can't do much. Uh, so we needed a longer flight time. We came to the conclusion we could use you know, anywhere around an hour would give us enough time to, to passively gather a significant amount of data or uh, actually do some uh, active attacks. Um, so we cogitated a little bit on it and determined that we could do that uh, reasonably cost effectively with uh, RC technology that currently existed. So with our basic requirements laid out of what we wanted to build, we kind of had to come up with a reason as to why. Because because just really isn't enough. It's, it's good in theory, but why are we wanting to build this? Well, to start off with low cost, we wanted to be, it's out of my own pocket, I don't want to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for this. So low cost, keep it cheap, keep it simple. Let's prove that, that by utilizing off the, uh, off the shelf and open source components, any of you guys can go out there and build this. You can mail order most of this stuff. Um, so we determined that, uh, you know, as we, as we kind of came together with the idea for this, uh, we realized that uh, no one's really looking at this as a, as, from a threat perspective. There's really some pretty evil stuff you can do from the sky. Um, so we decided we were, we were going to try to take it as far as we could go, and, uh, and our focus was going to be less on sort of rolling our own uh, flight systems. We, we really weren't interested in, in compiling our own code or, or building our own components or, or hardware. We wanted to see if we could go out there with a you know, credit card and some time 
and buy all the parts we needed and, and put the focus of the project on getting these things and doing some systems integration and, and, and less in, in terms of uh, creating from scratch. So specifications. What did we actually build? What is this big giant yellow thing you see in front of you? Let's take a look at some of the various components and what they're made of. To start off, we have the big giant yellow airframe. Uh, we, we elected to go with this airframe. It's, a, it's an ex-US Army target gunnery drone. Uh, the Army used to fly these things back in the mid-80s. Uh, there would be a soldier on the ground flying it like a remote control airplane. Uh, in its stock form, it had a gas, uh, or a gas or a glow motor, rather. Uh, and he would fly it around, and soldiers would shoot at it to sharpen their anti-aircraft skills. Uh, it, made a great, uh, it made a great donor frame for us uh, because of a couple of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, it was free. <laughs> uh, Rich here had a, uh, had a hobby shop, and he happened to have one of these in his basement. So uh, we elected to use that. Uh, and Doesn't everybody? Uh, you know. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> so, but for a couple other reasons, it turned out to be a great airframe for us, especially uh, for our first swag at this. Uh, it's a reinforced foam construction with, uh, with an aluminum skeleton, so it's, it's really resilient and uh, it, it can take the crashes that will inevitably happen. For those of you who will be building one of these things when you get home, you will crash a lot. So, uh, so pick something that can survive the crash or could be easily repaired. The foam on this, uh, in, in several spots you can see there's, there's cracks and scars from where we've epoxied it back together. Uh, but it was designed to take bullets and keep on going, and that was perfect for what we were going to do. Uh, initially, it was also, uh, we, we knew we were going to be a heavy aircraft. There's gonna be a lot of componentry in here, uh, and so that we needed an aircraft that was capable of one, fitting all of the stuff inside of it, and two, uh, lifting that amount of weight. And uh, uh, we're 14 pounds in this aircraft. I think the maximum uh, weight that this aircraft will fly with is 20 pounds, uh, from what I've researched up on the internet. Um, we haven't gotten anywhere close to that, but uh, in the meantime, that's been a, it's been a perfect aircraft for us. So now that we have an airframe, we need to get it off the ground. The original airframe was designed by the U.S. Army to run off of a, what's called a 60-size nitromethane motor. It uses a nitromethane fuel. It's very greasy, oily. It uses castor oil for a lubricant, and it's very, very noisy. Um, so we opted to go with a, what's called an E-Flight 90 brushless outrunner motor. This is a three-phase AC motor that's mounted right behind the propeller, provides 2.5 horsepower um, and can easily lift this aircraft off the ground. Um, it spins a 17 inch by 10 inch propeller and it's powered by a Castle Creations Phoenix HV85 electronic speed controller and twin six cell 22.2 volt lithium polymer batteries at 5,000 milliamp hours a piece. So it, as we kind of put these components together, we realized we're gonna have to make significant modifications to the airframe. Um, Obviously, when it was uh, in its original form, it was a hand-launched aircraft. The, uh, the soldiers would simply hold it over their head, run up the engine, take a couple of steps, throw it into the air, and off it would fly. Uh, but with all this extra weight and uh, cost associated, we didn't want to take the chance with that. So we fitted it with landing gear uh, and a movable tailwheel uh, so that we could actually steer it and fly it, uh, take it off from the ground. Uh, it is a manual takeoff and landing aircraft, so we needed a way to navigate on the ground and then come back and land. Uh, without damaging any of the antenna on the bottom of the aircraft. Uh, initial testing uh, revealed that even though the, uh, the aircraft did fly with its regular uh, elevator surface area, we had a real problem with pitch control, and so uh, because of the, the slow speed handling characteristics and the fact that we had needed to, man to manually land it, uh, we decided we were gonna add some additional elevator area and a rudder um, in order to make landing and, and slow speed handling a little bit easier. Avionics bay. This is essentially the brains of the airplane itself. This is, starts off as, as a typical RC setup. You've got a, a Japan Radio or JR Spectrum DX6I transmitter. That's this sitting on the table here. It uh, handles six channels. Now, why 2.4 gigahertz? Well, this, the, the, uh, the old frequencies that are used for RC airplanes is 72 megahertz. It's a harmonic for 900 megahertz, which you'll see will be a, could cause a, pose a pretty big interference issue. Inside the avionics bay, we've got a U-Blox 5 GPS. This is a very high refresh rate, very high accuracy GPS to tell the avionics where exactly in the world it is. 
We have a DIY drones RG pilot. This is an Arduino-based auto, autopilot that is open source and available for purchase. It's about $40. Uh, it communicates with the Argy Shield and the XYZ axis thermal sensor piles. You can see one of them on the side of the aircraft here. I'll swap it around so they could actually see it. Um, and what this does is it allows the aircraft to determine the difference in temperature between the sky and the ground. Hey, Rich, you want to? Here, I'll just hold it up. You can show them. XYZ sensor here. Um, that allows the aircraft to determine its, its position in 3D space. This autopilot is uh, programmed using a Google Map or Google Earth type application where you essentially just plot waypoints. I want to fly here and fly here and then fly here and then fly here for five minutes and then fly home. You upload it into the, to the aircraft and when you flip a switch on the remote, it goes into autopilot mode and executes its course and does its thing. Um, this Argy pilot is in between your receiver for your JR radio and the servos or the actuators for the various control surfaces on the aircraft. That allows it to intervene and control the servos directly. But what's nice is it goes into a fail safe mode uh, so that manual control is always possible no matter what. In addition, in the avionics bay, we also have an XB900 Pro with an Adafruit adapter. This is a serial link to the, Adaf uh, to the RG pilot itself that allows telemetry data to come go somewhere specifically this base station we'll talk about in a minute here. But that allows me to get GPS coordinates, airspeed, pitch, yaw, roll, battery voltage, everything I needed to know to make sure the health of the aircraft is fine. So that brings us to our payload. Uh, our payload is composed of, uh, of two main subsystems. Uh, the ones that you uh, see on the screen right now, this is the payload computer, and uh, that is, of course, the, uh, the left-hand saddlebag bay on the airframe. Uh, and also, uh, the USRP, which we have uh, uh, taken out of its enclosure and, and built a new yellow one. Um, the uh, payload computer itself is a VIA EPIA Pico ITX uh, mainboard. Looks like this. It's really small, really manageable. This is uh, one we fried a few, few days ago. Um, it features a 1 gigahertz uh, VSC7 CPU and a gig of RAM, and we have a 32 gigabit or a gigabyte, rather, uh, Voyager GTR flash drive that we have loaded Backtrack 5 on. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with Backtrack 5. In addition, the, uh, the payload bay also has uh, AWUS, uh, or, uh, AWUS 036H Alpha Networks 1 watt card, uh, which integrates with a belly mounted 7 dBi antenna. Uh, and our most recent addition, uh, Rich purchased a Ubertooth 1 because it was interesting and cool. Uh, so we also now have Bluetooth sniffing capability. Now, uh, in order for us to be interactive with the payload while it's in the air, uh, we have a second uh, XB Pro 900 uh, that resides here. That's this antenna that provides us with a uh, PPP connection to our base station. Uh, the base station then, of course, uh, acts as a... Wow. Look at that. That's nice. <laughs> The base station acts as an access point for us and all of our friends and whoever the evil bad guys are to, uh, to then funnel through to the airplane to, uh, to interact with the targets. Uh, if we were to go out of range uh, for whatever reason or we need a longer or bigger pipe, we have a uh, USB 4G dongle so we can do uh, big bandwidth uh, cellular data uh, so we can po also pop our, uh, our, our SSH connections over that uh, it also functions for OpenVPN uh, to pass all of our data and captures and whatnot back over the internet to our backend systems. And it uh, provides the pipe over which to send all of the SIP uh, information if you were uh, doing some evil cell phone middling uh, to our PBX. And that brings us to the, uh, e I'm sorry, my voice is killing. Uh, the Universal Software Radio Peripheral, USRP. We have a USRP-1 in the plane with two RFX-900 daughter boards. Uh, we use GNU Radio and OpenBTS to provide the, uh, the GSM interface. And uh, in order to do it reliably, uh, we've added a uh, clock tamer. It's a very highly configurable 52 megahertz clock. It's very highly accurate. Base station. What is this little yellow box that's sitting here on the table? Well, what this box is, is it's got a Overa Earth gumstick CPU with an ARM Cortex A8600 a Chestnut 43 add-on module that allows USB, Ethernet, 
and connection to a 4.3 inch touchscreen. In addition to that, it also has the DIY Drones Argue Station, which is their little kit project that you can put together that receives the telemetry data and displays it on this, this little green screen right here as soon as it boots up. And you can see all the pertinent information about the aircraft on that green screen. Now we've added one additional feature. Um, we've added an ASUS Wi-Fi access point. So essentially anyone in the front row can probably see the access point called WASP base station. If you connect to that base station, you go th into here through the XB that's on here, 900 megahertz, it establishes a PPP tunnel, you can SSH or secure shell directly into the payload of the aircraft. Anybody can do it. Now we're back to our back end systems. Uh, part of the concept of this project was that uh, we needed to do active stuff. And, that's, and it's all fine and good for, uh, for just war flying, but when you need to do some processor intensive stuff like WPA uh, brute forcing, uh, you need to have a machine with some horsepower. Uh, so we needed to have some way of, uh, of providing that horsepower to the airplane so that we could get captures off and, and pass them off and, and have them crunched on a machine that wasn't a one gigahertz um, flying airplane. So uh, it's basically a generic x86 PC. It's an Intel P4, uh, three gigahertz machine. It's got four gigs of RAM and a 500 gigabit hard drive uh, with an NVIDIA GTX 470. And that allows us to do some pretty cool things. Uh, we're using, for example, Pirate uh, to, to make use of the CUDA or the Compute Unified Device Architecture to really rapidly crank through uh, big dictionaries against uh, WPA four-way handshakes. Uh, the dictionary we have on our, on our station now, uh, for example, is four gigs in size. That's 350 plus uh, million entries. And we get through it uh, re relatively quickly, 4.5 hours, so it's a multi-mission thing. But uh, in addition to those kinds of tools, it also provides the PBX for uh, our GSM middling capabilities uh, and also is the hub for our open VPN connections. And that's uh, all of our friends out on the internet that can then pipe through to the airplane. Great. It's a lot of technical stuff. What can you do with it? Well, let's take a look at that. So what we're going to do now is walk you through sort of a system topology, how we have it laid out um, from end to end. Oops. Wow, touchy. Yes. So here we have our, uh, our victims. Um, and they're uh, illustrated by our Wi-Fi access point, our cell phone, and our QC unsuspecting Bluetooth adapter. Uh, and no, uh, no victim is complete without our attackers, and then we have our, our big attackers there. Uh, and they're just uh, slobbering to get all over those victims, but they can't reach it because there's a fence or uh, something in the way that prevents them from being able to sit outside in a Or maybe park. it's on the other side of the planet. It could be. Uh, but that's why they have an airplane. Uh, and that's great. Uh, the airplane can go ahead and, uh, and talk to those victims using its onboard systems, its Wi-Fi, and its uh, GSM capabilities. Uh, and that's great, but what we have now is, is very passive in nature. There's no way for the, uh, for the attackers really to, to talk to the victims at all. Uh, so we needed to create the base station, and that's that yellow box right there. And that, what that does is allow one us, uh, for us to get telemetry information from the aircraft, and that lets us know what the aircraft's position is and where it is in space and what its GPS coordinates are and airspeed and all the important stuff that we need to know. Uh, but additionally, it also allows us to pop open that PPP tunnel and actually and, uh, talk to and, and interact with the payload. And that allows the attackers on the ground to go ahead and, uh, and, and actually forward attacks against those victims. And that works great. Uh, but like we were saying with the, with the back end systems, uh, there are some things that require a little more horsepower than we can put on the airplane. And so there has to be some back-end systems that are out there that have the horsepower to do the kind of processing that you need for, for some of these attacks. Uh, and that's where the internet comes in. We want to be able to get back to that back-end system, which may be on the ground on the other end of the world or, or in some corner. Uh, so we have a 4G dongle on the plane uh, that we pop open a VPN connection to across the internet to our back-end systems, and that gives us access to all that horsepower. So now our attackers can uh, lay waste to the victim machines, capture the traffic that they need, uh, pass all of those high priority, high intensity processes off to this back end system for processing. And then the back end system will then send notifications back to the rest of us. Uh, and it does that through a script, and I'll let Rich go through the script here. There's a, I, 
I realized when we started developing this that we were going to have limited time on target. We needed to be able to have the, the evil guys to be able to give them as much time as possible to do the stuff that they want. So I devised this, a, a pair of scripts. There's one that runs on the airplane, very simple. It just monitors an input directory. Hackers find a WPA capture file. They dump it in the directory. The airplane handles it, sends it back home automatically. On the back end system, there's a, there's a sister script. And it monitors an incoming directory. And it does a couple of things based on the file extension of the, the files that it's passed. If it's passed a dictionary file, it will process that dictionary and add it to the current master dictionary to determine whether or not there's new unique entries that it needs to add. If you pass it a WPA capture file, it knows that you want to try and brute force that WPA capture file using the dictionary on hand. And it does that for you. And then emails you the results directly to your smartphone. The third and final piece that it does is it allows you to customize. Say I know my target. I know my target well enough to know some information about them. So I can develop a custom dictionary. I can pass that custom dictionary and the WPA capture file and send both of those at the same time. And the, the script on the back, back end system knows to process your custom dictionary against that WPA capture file and re significantly reduce the amount of processing time to find out whether or not you got a positive hit. Once it's done, it then incorporates that custom dictionary into the master dictionary so we have it for prosperity. So in, so in addition to that, the 4G uh, connection and the fact that we have our open VPN uh, host out on the internet allows us to not only connect our attackers, but say our attackers are up against a, a, a box that has a certain application running and, and neither one of those attackers uh, is very good with that particular type of attack. They may have a friend in Korea or uh, Japan or, or, or in Europe somewhere that knows how to do that. He's really elite at that particular uh, attack. Well, they can call him up and since it's on the internet and uh, over VPN, he can just simply log right into the airplane and, uh, and do what he does best. This allows really uh, sort of a distributed network of attackers to, uh, to funnel through one single point. And now, uh, all of this data is flying around. Uh, you need to protect it. And so uh, all of our communication links are either uh, hardware or, uh, or software AES encrypted uh, so that we won't let the good guys know what the bad things we're doing. What you're looking at here is an RF propagation map. The spot right directly in center is Caesar's Palace. This is RF propagation for both the 900 megahertz GSM radios and the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. The yellow area in the center that's about 1,500 feet across covers the entire Caesars Palace complex. This is essentially guaranteed connection. I can reliably connect to you at any time. The green area on the map is where I can listen to data. I can sniff packets. I can use Kismet. I can gather information. I may or may not be able to reliably connect. Movie time. Uh, yes, our movie time. Get the popcorn. So this was our, late, our latest test flight. This was after we had uh, made the modifications to the tail and rudder. Um, oh, there's no sound. Oh, there it is. It's just low. It's on here. There's no sound. We have off-road tires, so we're good. <laughs> this is just outside of Scott Air Force Base. And uh, once you're airborne, about midway through the video, you'll see a little dot on the horizon, which is actually a C5A galaxy. It looks a lot bigger in person. So now we're climbing up to altitude. Uh, we're buzzing around a little bit. This is, this is probably 350, 400 feet up, maybe, uh, if that. So there's what you see from the ground. That's what you hear from the ground, too. It doesn't make any noise once you're about 50 feet away. You can't hear anything. Never 
watch this with a fever, it kind of gives you a vertigo. That might be a little hard to see. So it kind of gives you an impression of how, uh, of what the signature of it will be from the ground from an observer that, uh, that may be standing. It's really not noticeable. Um, it makes a little bit of a buzzing, but, uh, but beyond that, it's, it's really not anything that you would notice, especially in, a, in, a, you know, in an urban or a re residential environment without a noise ground. And we'll be pulling around here for a landing in just a moment. Yeah, we're coming. There's a C5. Oh, there's that C5. From the ground, they look the same size. <laughs> like I said, this, uh, this aircraft is manual takeoff and manual landing. The new version of the Ar Arduino uh, RG Pilot, the RG Pilot Mega has automated takeoff, automated landing capabilities. And look at that, we're on the ground. And we've gone back in time. Yes, apparently we have. Bear with us one moment, find where we were. I'm clicking there. Ooh, speedy. Does it need to? Yeah, probably. So anyway, we're going to run over quick. Uh, we've already shown you some of the uh, some of the things on the base station. Uh, the base station, like I said, is, is our uh, hub for telemetry data. Uh, it's where the aircraft streams its telemetry data that's just displayed on this screen here. Uh, obviously, we've got our touch screen. It is uh, Wi-Fi accessible. Uh, while Rich is uh, rebooting here. Skip ahead and do the USRP. It's the next slide. Ah, all right. Well, we're not going to actually turn on the, uh, the USRP and, and steal all your cell phones today. Um, really didn't, uh, didn't do our homework and, uh, and put up the warning signs that we should have. So for fear of, uh, of repercussions, we'll show you what we've got here. Um, this is uh, the output of OpenBTS with, on the plane uh, with my MZ mostly blocked out. But the 310-410 is my... Uh, is AT&T in the US, uh, MNC and MCC. And this is, uh, this is based on a, on a uh, presentation that we saw last year. Uh, Chris Paget, very smart guy, he, uh, he really wet our whistle with, uh, with his MZ catcher brief. And we thought, that was so cool. We've got to put it on the airplane. And, and so we did. And, uh, and lo and behold, it works. Um, and what it, what it does is basically you're spoofing a, a legitimate cell tower uh, by using its MNC and MCC and uh, network short name. Um, Phones camp over to it, and then you pipe that information out across uh, the 4G connection back to our PBX, uh, wherever our uh, base of operations is, and then that gets forwarded out to our VoIP provider for, uh, for conversion out onto the, uh, the PSTN. Did it come back up? Yeah, good. Let me back up here one. As soon as Rich uh, is... It always works fine until you're on stage. Bear with us one moment. It's not connecting. Hardware, isn't it great? So it appears we have some sort of hardware issue. Um, I believe the flash drive is giving us issues. No, I did reboot. 
I just did. It's it's booting. It's going through um, FSCK. All right. So let's uh, we'll yeah. come back to this here in a minute when we get the system all rebooted. So we've got all these capabilities and we can do all these nice things, but what's it going to cost to build one of these? Let's, uh, let's talk about this for a few minutes. I'll be really quick because this is really dry and really boring. It's just a bunch of numbers. The airframe itself was free. Had one. If you want to buy one just like this, you can find them occasionally on eBay for about $150, $200 for the airframe. The payload computer itself, $640 for all the various components. The USRP was probably the single most expensive component we had to purchase at $1,600. Uh, the avionics bay and the RC equipment was another $800. The power plant, the motor, the batteries, the propeller, and the wire, and the speed controller was $800. The base station, the gumstick Overo Earth setup was $350. The RG station itself was about $100. Uh, Wi-Fi access point, $50. Bucks. Seven port USB hub that's in the front that allows you to connect keyboard, mouse, and interact with the base station directly, and a little project box to stick it in was another 50 bucks. Generic Air X86 PC, $600 for the back end system, and at the time, the NVIDIA card was right around $300. So what we've got sitting, sitting here is about $6,200 worth of equipment. We've added $500 for the price tag for uh, screws, nuts, bolts, wire, paint, glue, marine quality plywood, all the various little nitnoid stuff we had to buy over the, the course of the construction. So let's talk about some of the threats. Ah, threats. Well, the good news is it's not all bad. Uh, mostly not all bad. Uh, I got it. Oh, I got it. Oops. So who can use these? Hackers can use these. Uh, who are the hackers? Well, they're loosely affiliated groups of folks. Uh, we've all been kind of familiar with what they're doing nowadays. Uh, and they attack uh, governments, companies, organizations. Uh, they want your data. They want to steal privacy data. They want to shut down your site. They want access to your stuff. Uh, but growing, uh, increasingly, they're geographically separated. Uh, they're united by ideology, but separated by, geolo by geology. Uh, their skills are, are spread out amongst the membership, and what the UAV uh, gives them is the ability uh, to give these distributed groups uh, direct access to a single target, and to do so from outside of their, uh, of their boundary. Uh, so hackers across the planet can converge on a single airplane and, and, and attack behind the firewall at the access point in your Starbucks in your lobby. Uh, we spend a lot of money on physical security. Companies uh, dump billions worldwide into fences and guard shacks and, and all kinds of high-tech gizmos that protect against the threat that is the guy with the backpack or driving a car. Uh, these devices allow you to, to reach out. Uh, no one's looking at the sky. Uh, it's really hard to keep something that's flying from getting over your facility or, or near your, uh, your crown jewels of data. So. How does the UAV assist in, in performing an attack on a target? Well, for the reconnaissance phase, we can do war driving, or in this case, war flying. Uh, we can analyze and map, categorize the wireless networks, pick the juiciest targets. That's pretty common. Uh, we can collect data from uh, individual wireless devices passively, Kismet, that type of thing, um, BSSIDs, MAC addresses, cellular data. We can combine that data with available internet resources, um, wiggle Wi-Fi, that type of thing. Um, we can follow a target home. We can identify a target by his cell phone, follow him home to where enterprise security doesn't reach. Um, we basically are able to reverse engineer someone's life and hit them where security is the weakest. On the attack side, we can brute force web, we can brute force WPA. We can provide rogue wireless access points. Starbucks, free Wi-Fi, connect to me. We have internet connection. You get 4G internet connection, and I'm man in the middling all of your data. Um, we can do scanning, client exploits, 
redirection, data theft. I mean, we've got Backtrack 5 available. It has a very big suite of tools to use and leverage on, an, on a target. Data exfiltration. Well, there's an onboard broadband connection that allows me to take your data out through your wireless connection and out to the internet directly to wherever it is that I'm at. There's a re reduced chance of discovery here because I'm not going through your firewall. I'm not going through your IPS, your IDS. I'm going out your back door, your cafe free Wi-Fi that you set up for employees to surf on their, their lunch hour. Um, cell phone attacks, same type of thing, reconnaissance attack, data exfiltration. But in addition to that, it could be possible to do cell phone jamming signals to do a denial of service on, cells, um, on cellular signal. We can attack the weakness in GSM implementations to spoof legitimate carriers and man in the middle a cell, uh, a cell tower. We can listen in on, on the audio. We can even redirect the calls so that when you think you're calling 911, you're actually calling me. Who wants to do that? You're only going to do it once. So disaster relief. With very few modifications, other than making it not yellow. Um, we can use this, this UAV to provide cellular access to a disaster area. You've got a tsunami, an earthquake, a hurricane, wipes out cell service, wipes out internet service. These are cheap enough you can put four or five of them over a disaster area and provide instant cell service, instant internet for text messaging, quick emails, getting in contact with loved ones. Search and rescue, we can outfit this with a infrared camera and shape recognition technology to run search patterns over the woods looking for lost hikers. We could even go to a disaster area, find active IMSIs or cell phones and alert ground rescue that you might want to go check out this house because there's an active cell phone there. Nobody ever goes anywhere without their cell phone. Helicopters are expensive, about $500,000 for a helicopter, not including the cost of training for the pilot and the crew and the fuel that it takes to run search patterns. We can also provide radio beacon detection with a few modifications to once again pick up on the cellular's emergency um, rescue me beacons. Law enforcement border protection. The IR camera that is available online can be outfitted and used just the same for law enforcement and border protection as it is for search and rescue. We got border protection problems. We can put up a bunch of these scan for people trying to cross the border, and then a ground troop can actually look at those photos and go, yeah, we need to send somebody there. No, that's just a dog. Don't worry about that. That increases your on-ground time, your, your ability to, to react to those situations in a much more timely fashion. Um, it's truck mountable, hand launchable. Military, electronic countermeasures. We've already got covered most of the radio frequencies on board the aircraft now. Adding a few more wouldn't really take much more effort. Um, could be used for decoys, jamming, fly it along the ground and uh, do IED interdiction. Um, have it blow that up instead of the truck full of troops. We can use it as a communications relay. You've got troops on the other side of a mountain. Fly one of these overhead, over above the mountain and you've got an instant relay between the two sides of the mountain to talk to each other. We could be a forward observer, intelligence collection from visual and signals. And because it leverages off-the-shelf components, changing the payloads or modules that are in the aircraft are just plug and play. You pull this USB device out, stick in another USB device. Pull out this payload, stick in another one. So you can really customize what we've got to really meet the mission that you're trying to deploy. Ah, yes, and now for the apocalypse. Um, everyone get out your FUD detectors, because uh, here it goes. Uh, Let's talk about the folks uh, beyond the cyber threat. Uh, UAVs pose a couple of unique challenges to people who are responsible for protecting things. Uh, and, they're, and they come from a variety of sources. Uh, we'll start with the, the tinfoil hat crowd because uh, we all know these people. Some of us are these people. Uh, they're sure that uh, Area 51 is hiding the aliens. Uh, and they need to get in there and find it because they don't believe Google Earth. Uh, these types of things allow them to do uh, you know, incredibly previously uh, unattainable things, like get imagery of these sensitive national areas, labs, military bases, government buildings, uh, that sort of thing. And it poses a little bit of a, of a public safety threat. Um, 
but uh, not so much as the legitimate criminals. Uh, organized crime, uh, we all know about uh, the, the drug problems we have on our southern borders. Um, they spend millions of dollars, drug cartels, on, on transporting illicit cargo across our borders and in the country. They do it in subs, they do it in cars, trucks, on people. Uh, you name it, they do it. Uh, they're really, really creative. Uh, they're currently using ultralights. There's a great picture of a crashed drug ultralight in the field uh, to smuggle things across the border now. Uh, this is a, is a great sort of uh, way for them to do that. Um, is that next? Don't know. Is anyone thinking about that is the, is the question. Uh, for example, our UAV can carry uh, quite a bit of uh, value, $300,000, $400,000 in cocaine in, in just this one. Uh, if you made it bigger, of course, you could carry more. Uh, $175,000 in heroin. Uh, they're cheap. They don't stop for cops. Uh, and if they do get caught, they don't tell on you. Uh, so they're really attractive uh, to, to criminals who need to get things anonymously across borders. Ah, uh, yes, now the big one. Now the alarms start going off and people start calling. Uh, terrorism, domestic and international. Uh, terrorists, uh, like the organized criminals, are very crafty and they're diligent. They will think about all kinds of crazy ways to uh, disrupt life and kill people and damage property. Uh, since 9-11, there's been tons of plots, hundreds of them, uh, and they involve all kinds of, of targets, military targets, soft civilian targets, skyscrapers, buildings, sports events, all kinds of stuff, uh, and they experiment with all kinds of delivery methods. They put explosives in people's underwears and shoes, uh, printer cartridges, you've seen them on the news. They are very crafty folks. Uh, what happens when they learn that all this technology is out there and well, they can put it together and for the cost of sending one guy here to learn to fly a plane, they can build a fleet of planes uh, that can anonymously deliver whatever they want to put in it anywhere at any time. It's kind of a scary thought. Uh, but even beyond that, um, non-hazardous cargo can be just as dangerous. Um, we all worry about uh, the, you know, the explosives and, and, and you know, crazy things like this. But what happens if they put vinegar and baking soda into it and crash it into a field at the Super Bowl? The Stampede will do uh, everything that they want to do and they haven't shown up on anyone's list by buying something that's uh, going to put them on a, on a watch list. And now we're to the really scary stuff. Uh, dirty bombs. Um, it doesn't take a lot of radiation to, uh, to make people move away. Uh, here we have some examples. These are, uh, these are taken from a case study uh, in 2002, Dr. Henry Kelly, uh, the president of the American Federation of Scientists, uh, he gave a, a, a deposition to the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. The first, uh, the first image that you see in the, uh, in the top, uh, I guess it's the, uh, the right-hand corner, is an image of Manhattan. Um, and this was a, a study that they did that showed the effect of a radioactive cobalt-60 sample. Uh, these things are about an inch in diameter and about you know, 12 inches long. And uh, they're commonly used to irradiate food in our food, irradi food irradiation plants. Uh, now, if one of those were to, to be detonated in Lower Manhattan, uh, for example, that inner ring that you see, the smallest one over, the, uh, over Lower Manhattan, that would, uh, that would be the same radiation levels as the permanently closed area around Chernobyl. Um, now, we spend, again, a lot of money on, on detectors for this sort of thing on bridges and in roads, but who's checking the sky? Where is it? Uh, how do we protect our... Uh, our infrastructure from that sort of an attack. Um, down at the bottom, you'll see Washington, D.C. This is another one of the, uh, of the studies that they did. Uh, this was based on a pea-sized uh, amount of cesium-137 from, a, for example, a medical gauge or some other medical device, and 10 pounds of TNT. Uh, obviously, that's less than the 14 pounds that we're flying right now. And you can see what the effects would be in the, in the picture in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, that effectively renders our capital even less useful to us than it is currently. Uh, but the, the point behind this slide is that uh, this technology and the availability of all of these various uh, components on the internet creates an ability for bad guys to have distance and anonymity, two things which are, are you know, we rely upon for our physical security. So what we're getting at here is that you don't need a PhD from MIT to do this.
Apparently you do because ours is not booting. <laughs> yes, well. Stage fright. Uh, this has no custom parts. Everything is easily available online. We mail ordered 95% of this. The only piece we didn't mail order was the airplane itself, just because I had it in the basement. It's fabricated using hand tools in my garage. This is not a skunk works factory. This is just a garage with drills and hammers and saws and exacto knives and glue. Uh, it, the airframe itself is pretty resilient and forgiving. It's been crashed a couple of times already, and if you get a chance to look at it real close, you can look around the neck of the cockpit. It's pretty much broken completely off. The wing has a big crack in it, but it still flies. The video you saw was the way it is right now, busted and broken. Very little coding is required, and, and even the coding that, I, that was done wasn't difficult. It's just bash scripts. It's nothing really spectacular. The difficulty of the project, if, you, if you're going to take this on, really depends on how far you want to go. The easiest thing you can do is just a drone, a uh, semi-autonomous airplane. You can pick one of those up as a kit from uh, DIY Drones, I believe, sells them with the RG Pilot in them, and it, you flip a switch and it'll fly around on your pre-plotted course. Then you get a little more, more difficult if you add a camera to it or uh, where you're doing streaming video from the aircraft, then you have to worry about the XBs and getting communication channels, so your difficulty level starts to get up a little bit higher. Then as you get into the cyber drone where you've got you know, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and USRP and all these various components that make it very difficult to apparently boot, um, it gets really, really hard and complicated because you've got all these things that are intermeshing together and they don't always like to talk. All this requires dedicated people. You just need to be dedicated to do this. Whether it's me or him or you, if, if you've got the enthusiasm to do this, it, you can. Um, but realize that there's no requirement for good intentions. This does not come with morals and ethics, so you have to apply those yourself. Ah, yes. Well, here's some of the online resources we used uh, when building the product. Uh, so if, if some of these will help you out, uh, check them out if you're interested in this sort of, uh, if this type of research and you want to build your own. Uh, these are great resources for you to go and, and, and take a look at them. Uh, I encourage you to spend some time there. So we'd like to give some special thanks for this. Uh, Dave Farquhar, our, our editor. Uh, without him, most of what we wrote wouldn't appear to be in English. Um, and most importantly, our significant others uh, for being very, very understanding for us for the many, many hours that we spend in the garage when we should have been paying attention to them. I'd like to open the floor up for questions. Question? I'm sorry, say again? What altitude do we fly at? Ah. According to FAA regulations, a UAV must be flown under 400 foot of altitude at all times and must remain within light of sight. The specifications for the airframe by the U.S. Army is 22,000 feet. 400 feet. 400 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and within line of sight. Uh, and there are, there are in fact, uh, safety, sort of safety catches built into the, uh, to the Ardu pilot, uh, which you have to circumvent uh, in order to break the law. Um, it, not that it is terribly difficult to do so. Uh, it's eminently possible, but um, yes, uh, you can make it do it, but we operate at 400 feet and below and within line of sight uh, simply for those reasons to remain in compliance with the law. Yes? With the electric power plant that we currently have, we get, uh, depending on how aggressive we are in the throttle and the weight and loadout, um, 30 to 45 minutes of flight at about 25 miles an hour. Um, so theoretically, we could probably do a one-way trip of maybe 50 miles at some point. Uh, we could probably do you know, 25 for a round trip, depending on how the mission was planned. Now, um, electric power is one thing. You can easily swap it back to a, to a sort of a combustion engine setup. And in that setup, it's literally hundreds of miles. You know, some t depending on how good you are with tuning, it could be thousands of miles uh, in a single trip. Uh, so. Tam, TAM-5 made it across the, the ocean. Took off from, where did it take off from? Yeah, there was a, actually a, 
I guess it was about 10 years ago, a guy named Maynard Hill uh, was successfully, uh, successfully flew an automated aircraft across the Atlantic Ocean. It was a distance of like 3,000 something kilometers. It was amazing. Um, and he did it in a, in a very similar uh, type of airframe. So, any other questions we can answer? Um, yeah, it, I mean, you could, depending on how good you are at a, with, a, with the sticks, neither uh, me nor him could hit Australia if we had to land it. But um, I need about uh, 200 yards to land it safely. Uh, we've, we've, with our test pilot, uh, they can put it down in you know, maybe 40 feet tops. Yes, sir. Have you been able to sniff Yes, um, well, uh, from... From altitude, we got 50 something. Yeah, on the, on the test flight you saw, we actually uh, saw about 50 access points from that altitude. Any other questions? Yes, sir. That's a good question. Just about everybody I've talked to, that, that question inevitably comes up. And my answer to that is I don't know. The reason for that is because nobody's. Oh, how, how would you defend against this? <laughs> well, <Awesome. laughs> problem with missiles. Missiles are done either through heat or radar signature. I have neither. So how do you defend against this? I don't know. That's what you guys are for. You need to get the right people in the right room and start thinking about this. How would you defend against something like this? Because if we thought of it, Somebody else has. They're just not telling you about it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What's next for you guys? Is this a hobby or are you going to take it further? Uh, yes, this was a hobby, actually, or a <laughs> life. I'm not sure which. <laughs> I don't know what classifies as a hobby. Um, it, it, to tell you the truth, I'm just going to continue thinking about it. Um, improving the, uh, improving the, the UAV, uh, changing things. We're looking at, uh, in the future, uh, some of the visual stuff, the, uh, the three-axis cameras, head tracking, all of that cool stuff, uh, infrared. Uh, making our own airframe is, is something that may be down the road for us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. It's, it's, whatever our, uh, it's whatever our fancy takes us to. Uh, for the next month or two, I'm going to do nothing on it. <laughs> yeah, even though it sounds like we laid out a whole bunch of plans, a lot of this was just ad hoc, and hey, let's do this, and let's try that, and... You know, we, we, we chose the airframe because, well, it's convenient, but now we're looking at it, you know, we only get 30 to 45 minutes of safe flight time out of it, and we're looking at some, you know, powered glider airframes that weigh about a half a pound and have 12-foot wingspans, and trying to figure out how we can extend that flight time using the equipment that we have to uh, extend our time on target. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, we estimated, I think, between 1,300 and 1,500 hours yeah. to get it to where it is today. Yes. I'm sorry, say again? The weather. problem with a weather balloon is it's very susceptible to weather changes. Uh, if you've got a 5 or 10 mile an hour wind, good luck staying on target. Um, with this, I have 15 mile an hour wind, I can loiter around a, a, a building or, or a vehicle or anything for as long as the batteries will keep me there, the, but, the wind doesn't really affect it very much. The short answer is yes, you can do uh, you know, very similar things. You can float the package, you know, the payload up on a, on a weather balloon. Um, weather balloons are, are sort of noticeable and they're difficult, they don't move. Uh, so if my target moves or if I've got a, a significant distance to go and I don't want to go there, um, because it may, may be behind a fence or something, so, somewhere I can't get to it, I, I could send a weather balloon over it, but we're talking about a, a, you know, a very large distance. They're harder to control. You can't, you can't really control the, 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 uh, you know, the environment as much as you can when you have positive control over it with, a, with an airframe. Yeah, if you put a, a weather balloon up over this building and then your target decides to leave and go down the street, it's very hard to move the weather balloon to follow him, whereas we can just tell the airplane to follow him and go down the street and listen to him talk while he's at the bar. Any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, in dealing with the hobby shop, I have dealt with up to uh, quarter scale, which won't fit on this stage. 
And uh, I believe there's a news article about three or four years ago where a gentleman had a quarter scale uh, Piper Cub that he had his granddaughter and grandson in and got in a lot of trouble for it. So that tells you how big, that tells you how big it can get if you want to spend the money on it. <laughs> yes, sir. As currently, men, just one. Yeah, currently, uh, but, just one. Uh, you know, theoretically, we could add additional uh, additional XPs and and, and pipe or, or create a mesh and create multiple. Uh, there are just IP addresses. So, yes. Uh, the amount of power. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, for the XPs, the XPs are 50 milliwatts, I believe. Are they uh, the I think there's a 50 milliwatt, 50 milliwatt of transmit power on the XPs. Uh, our Wi-Fi card is, uh, is one watt maximum. Uh, yeah, well, inter interestingly, the, the two big batteries you see, the sil big silver packs, we can run the payload and avionics for about 10 hours. The motor itself draws 32 amps at half throttle. So it's a big soda straw sucking the juice out of it. Any other questions? Yeah, yes. Uh, right now, it's sitting on, uh, I think when we did our last test, it was sitting on 975, which would have put it at uh, 925.2. So that would be inside the 33 centimeter band on the, uh, in the amateur radio spectrum. Yeah. But. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you apparently, like you apparently know more than I do. <laughs> I know that the, the transmit side of the GSM is running at 925.2, which is within the 33 centimeter band, which keeps me legal as long as we're transmitting my call sign every 10 minutes, which the USRP does every time a phone connects, it sends it via text. Any other questions? Yes, sir. It will affect it quite a bit. Um, we've done some web attacks, uh, obviously, from the, from the air. Um, other attacks, like the, the WPA we were talking about earlier, require a lot of offline processing. So it's, it's basically you, you run a capture file back to the, to the server, land the plane, and come back later after it's already been done. You're collecting them as you go. Uh, and then you launch the attack after the fact. But. It's also the reason we took the, the patch panel antenna, which is generally mounted vertically. We turned it and mounted it down so that the radiation pattern that from the RF goes out at an angle so that when the airplane's in a bank, it still stays on relatively on target as it circles. But it's, uh, you know, it's by no means a 100% a game. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of you know, power and, and surroundings. In a, in a city, you're going to obviously restrict your, your capabilities. If they're inside, you're also, you know, you're going to Oh boy! Uh, well, on, on our dummy systems, they're 100. percent They work great on the on the <laughs> test systems. So, but uh, you know, I mean, from the air, you're you're, you're not going to get 100 percent success rate. I couldn't quantify it in you know in terms of an absolute, but uh, but yes, yeah, this, it does affect your ability uh, you know, to have success. So, any other questions? Yes. Um, can you say that again? Oh. <laughs> no. Uh, oh, we've been at 400 feet uh, forever, so uh, we're we're okay there. Uh, we haven't had a problem with it. Uh, it, it actually works the better. Answer is no. <laughs> it works better at 400 feet because there's no buildings and trees in the way, so it connects really well. Yes, sir. Do you mean just set the, just set it down? 
Oh, go 400 feet above the top of this building? Yeah, I believe the FAA would kind yeah, of frown probably, on that. And, and, but we wouldn't fly it anywhere near here anyway, because McCarran is right next door, and they really frown on that. <laughs> What's that? Then it's just a, you know, it's just a piece of wireless equipment. If it's and then it's just there. as good as your laptop. Yep. Yes, sir. If you left your fingerprints on it, of course they can. But, uh, I mean, it's uh, wireless. If you can trace the wireless, then. Uh, you know, and, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, the, all of the hardware inside has, you know, traceable numbers associated with it. So, uh, you know, I'm sure if somebody had a big enough, uh, you know, pocketbook and wanted to spend the time, uh, they could probably narrow it down quite a bit. Uh, but determining on how, on how you purchased it, it could be, uh, you know, obfuscated in several ways. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Well, I think it is in some areas, but uh, you know, they're, they're, they're really sort of limited. Uh, everyone seems to be stuck in a paradigm of, uh, of just straight up video surveillance. So it's a, it's a flying camera. So uh, I don't know why they haven't expanded that to some more electronic surveillance. Uh, they seem to be sort of biased towards manned flight platforms versus unmanned flight platforms in this, in this country, at least. Sir, did you have a question? Yes, uh, I have. <laughs> blimps are notoriously hard to control outside, especially on a small scale. Uh, they're a little more sort of at the whim of weather. Uh, and they're a little harder to, because you have the big envelope, they're a little easier to spot from the ground, and, and your speed is kind of cut down, so your range, therefore, would be a little bit uh, smaller. So we elected to go with a, with a winged airframe versus the blimp, but it's a great idea for, uh, especially for low wind conditions and, and that sort of thing, increase your loiter time quite a bit. Anybody else? More questions? Yes, sir. Um, we had discussed that initially, and, and since we have a, a T-Mobile connection already, um, controlling the avionics through the payload is a simple addition of a, like a parallax microcontroller to serial connect to the, Ar to the Arduino and, and control it that way. We've not done that so that there's no illusions in the FAA's mind that we've weaponized this and made it into a completely autonomous, <laughs> remotely controllable hacking platform. Plausible deniability is good. Yes. It is very. <laughs> it's fairly plausible. Take what I can get. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, actually, we've, we've discussed on the 26 some hour drive here, we discussed <laughs> using um, some of the quadcopter technology to make a, a recoverable drone that would just drop down, run on solar cells, gather data and then burst transmit back to the aircraft when it flew back over. And when the mission was done, it would just pick up and fly a, fly a predetermined route back to a pickup location where you could. So just RTB after the fact. Just parachute it in, let it sit there, do its uh, job. You burst transmit to the plane on, on a daily or nightly basis. and then. And... Yes, sir. Because they weren't done. They weren't done when we put them in the aircraft. They were still having issues with the, uh, the IMUs with drift. Um, so we went with the, the RG Pilot 1. Now that they have the RG Pilot Mega, we're seriously looking at going to the IMUs with the, the gyros for more stability, more accuracy. Um, but. <laughs> Can't you just invert the code? Tell it it's mounted upside down? Oh, yes. I've been there. I lived there for a long time, so. <laughs> Anybody, the, any other questions? You know, helicopters are, are great. Um, they're really hard to do well with an autopilot. They're, uh, they're hard in terms of power. Uh, it, they suck down power like nothing else. So your, yeah, your I, time I, in the sky is, is really greatly reduced, especially if you're doing a, a, like an electric helicopter you're not going to get the same loiter time that you will out of an airplane. Um, and not as if this uh, is the best airframe for that. I mean, 
you could go with a glider frame and stay up for a very, very long time. But um, lots of folks are looking at the, uh, the quadcopters and helicopters, uh, and they have certain uh, strengths, like tight spaces inside urban environments and that sort of stuff. And it's just one of those things that we had to do one or the other, and we, we picked the, air, the airplane versus the helicopter uh, solution. But yeah, lots of folks are, are looking at helicopters for the same type of thing. Yes, sir. Yes, we've actually thought about it. Um, the problem right now is that the, the wing surface area really isn't enough. Um, like I said, the motor on the front draws 32 amps, so we, we need to be able to push some power to the batteries from solar cells. I think what we're going to have to do is run some sort of a switching circuit to run it off of one battery while the other one charges, and because uh, otherwise it's just not going to provide it. It would be a lot better with a with a bigger sort wing. of a glider frame versus this. Uh, so a little more surface area, a little better uh, wing loading. Um, but oh, look at this, my phone. What's that? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Is it not on the CD? It's not on the CD? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, yes, absolutely. No worries, I'll also make sure that they put it on the site so, so you can download and it. We'll, and we'll post it on our site as well. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the manufacturer that did, did this for the Army said maximum 20-pound wing loading. Uh, um, I think, well, like 1.5, no, God, what was it? It's I don't remember what the number is on the top of my head, but it was ridiculously uh, inefficient. Uh, it's a very high wing loading. Uh, it's a MIG. It's designed to go faster. It falls out of the sky. One of, one of the next things that we'll be doing is, is uh, going to a glider frame, uh, something with a, with a, <laughs> with a smaller minutes. wing loading. Uh, any more questions? Currently, we have to retrieve it to get the video out right now. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of our future deals will be the three axis camera and uh, pipe it out over IP on the 4G connection. Uh, we just didn't have time to get it done before we got here. Uh, so. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we want CNN. Down. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> the, 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 the first time we took off, <laughs> oh uh, we had a we had a woefully undersized propeller on the front of it. We had a 14-inch prop, and it uh, only had four pounds of thrust for a 14-pound aircraft. It went up immediately, stalled, and nosed into the ground from about 30 feet up. Cracked the front, cracked the nose off of it. So, yeah, that was pretty depressing. That's the trick, is, the, is balancing the, the weight versus the thrust versus the, the wing load to make sure that you stay aloft um, and don't slide off the wing or, or stall it out. Yeah. Well, and, and by going to a, a larger glider style frame, we're going to drop the seven pounds of styrofoam that we've got and go to probably a three or four pound. Uh, so we'll be able to drop significant amount of weight that way. We'll probably look at going to um, probably a different battery pack. Um, there's a lot of things in the future that we may get to a couple months from now after I take a break. Any other questions, comments? Right. Yes, sir. It's It'd be different. A little more of the maker focused talk versus sort of the, a lot of threat stuff. And in this one, the, the DEF CON is going to be a little more sort of maker oriented. So, folks. Yeah, we talk about our mistakes. Yeah, we're, it's, it's a lot more. Uh, the first part's the same, last part's, uh, you know, lessons we, learned. Yeah, we talk about our mistakes. Yeah, that we, uh, yeah. The stuff we really messed <laughs> up on. And there were lots of. 